Hello, uh, my name is Will, and this is a quick re-recording of a pr presentation that I gave uh, to our UNE's Teaching and Learning Symposium over Zoom. And so this is the video version that I'll post up to YouTube. Now, it's on Gameforce Open Source Self-Publishing and Robots, and of course, uh, computer scientists are known for eating their own dog food, as they say. Uh, so this is a talk on self-publishing, and so the talk is self-published. Uh, so if you go to that link there, you will find the actual deck that I'm talking to. Now, let's go even a little bit more meta. Let me drop out of the presentation mode. And so here is this deck with all the slides laid out underneath each other. Let me skip all the way down to the end. Whoops, I went past it. And uh, over here. And let me go to where this deck is on a site called GitHub which is where computer programmers often like to share their source code. Uh, now, as I scroll through the deck, you'll see that it looks a little bit like code. It's a little bit of a script writing the deck. And it might look a little complicated, but, uh, you know, it's saying I want a markdown slide that has this text on it. I want a section title. I want a landscape image, etc. This is stuff that would hopefully make a bit more sense uh, to you later on. And I'll talk about this later. Uh, but uh, the idea of writing these things uh, in kind of an almost code like manner isn't actually that uncommon. Um, so LaTeX is a system that academics have been using to write papers in a way that looks a bit like code for 37 years. Anyway, let's scroll down to that last slide where there's this little message, Mamma Mia, here we go again. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, whoops, go and click edit on this file. I'm going to scroll back down there and I'm going to change the message so it says, thank you for the music. So thank you for the music. And then I'm going to save this uh, edited message on the last slide. And when I save it, this talk isn't just published uh, to GitHub, it is being continuously published to GitHub. Uh, so GitHub is going to kick off a publication workflow that I have con configured that is going to take all of these scripts and it's going to compile it up into a website for me and then it is going to publish it. So if I go up here and I click on actions, I should see that already edited message on the last slide and we can see if I went totally technically in there, I could go and see what GitHub is doing running this automatic publication workflow for me. Uh, and if you wanted to be a bit sneaky, you could have a look and see all of the previous changes that I've made to this talk, including where I re recorded this video uh, another time just beforehand, uh, except my, my video recording was dropping frames left, right and centre. It was a bit janky, so I lowered the resolution of the screen to re-record it. OK, enough of diving into the technical details too early. Let's go back from being meta about the talk to giving the talk. So let's scroll back up to the top here and let me press uh, play on the deck itself. Now, this talk, it's kind of an abridged version of two talks that I've given at conferences. One is revisiting the intelligent book towards seamless intelligent content and continuously deployed courses. Oh, what a mouthful of a title that was at ASCII Light in 2020. And the other one was talking about the particular course that I'm going to be talking about, an accelerated CS0 for online mature age part-time students that was at ITICSI, a uh, big European computing education conference uh, in 2021, plus a few little new bits. I, I keep sneaking bits of what I'm working on now rather than just presenting the papers that I've, that I've written. All right, what I'd like to start talking about, what computational thinking looks like in a physical setting. If you've been along to any programming outreaches, any computational thinking outreaches, they probably looked a bit like this. This is one we ran uh, down at Armadale Secondary College in 2019, and you can see lots of people gather around computers, gather around robots, solving problems, getting uh, robots through mazes and doing things, picking things up off the cups and carrying them to the end, etc. And you can see up there, there's some there's some code that a group have been uh, sharing. Uh, but there's a lot of talking and problem solving and being gathered together in a room around physical items. Uh, or it might look like this one. So this is the coding escape that I ran in Tamworth the year before. And so again, we've got kids gathered in rooms talking about things. And OK, this one's the other way around. Most of the stuff they're doing is on the computing, but there's still some stuff up on the walls. Maze mats, we post it notes as we kind of talk about the algorithms as to how these things solve these different uh, different things. Um, but that's not the context we're in. 
UNE, most of our students are online. And we were introducing a Diploma of Information Technology in February 2020. And uh, yeah, 90% of the students we were expecting were going to be online. And then there was a pan pandemic and all of them were going to be online. And in that online context, well, you might be the only student in your city. You can't gather together with any of the other students because they're hundreds of kilometers from you, sometimes thousands of kilometers from you. We get students occasionally studying from different countries. Um, and they're mostly part-time. They have uh, different lives, different schedules. And so they struggle to meet a time together where they could get together on Zoom as well. So they, you know, struggle to gather together in a room physically or virtually. And they're a mostly mature age cohort. So unlike this picture, where all of the kids are around about the same age and have similar educational background because they've all done the same previous classes, we've got students from all over the place, some of whom have never done any coding before, some of whom actually it's their job. They're already in industry and they do coding, but they've decided they want to get the degree in it. Oh, and there's a pandemic going on. Well, what does this look like? What does CS0 mean in an online part-time mature age setting? Uh, CS0, incidentally, is a nickname that has appeared in computing circles for the subject you take before your first proper programming course, kind of a broad subject that exposes you to lots of different experiences and problem solving and creativity in computing that can touch on lots of different topics that are going to come up later. Uh, well, what's this look like if it's not your first exposure to computing? If some of the students in the class have done a heap of it before and others maybe a bit less, but there's lots of computational thinking getting into schools these days. Well, I wanted still to be able to promote conversations between these potentially isolated online students around outreach style robotics challenges. And I wanted to be able to stretch and um, challenge the more experienced students so they don't get bored without making the course unachievable for inexperienced students. And so one of the things I wanted to do was really compress the introduction of programming, the syntax, the what you type at the keyboard, the, the, the whiles, the opening and closing parentheses, the curly brackets, etc., right up the beginning so that we could spend more time doing the problem solving in interesting situations and less time worrying about um, whether it's a, a round parentheses or a, or a, or a curly bracket there. While I was doing this, well, I'd been building this kit for doing things that uh, I call intelligent books after my PhD, which was doing an earlier version. It was called the Intelligent Book Project. Uh, but basically, these are things that let us make the learning environment programmable, let us connect all sorts of uh, interesting diagrammatic things, clever things, simulation things, AI things, etc. So, for instance, over on the right, and this is kind of all about making things prodable, I call it. Uh, but over on the right, we have a simulation of a MOSFET. This is the most common kind of transistor in the world. Some number of trillion of these have been made and are in the chips inside your computers and your phones, etc. And uh, they, they, there's a voltage across the drain and the source, and there's a voltage across the gate. And, it, you know, explaining it would be a little bit difficult. But I can say that, OK, well, as we change the, the voltage from the drain and the source, this much current flows. And the chart kind of looks a bit like this. But as we increase the gate voltage, suddenly it starts to look a bit more like that. Or, well, let, let's leave it in the middle so we can kind of see as I move the gate voltage, that dot go up. And then now the curve looks a little bit like this. And so it makes these things a bit more prodable and explorable because it's all quite immediate and interactive. Now, for electronics, there's a thing I made called Circuits Up that has a whole bunch of these. Don't have time to go into all of that right now. Let's keep moving on. If we can do things like circuit simulations, we can also start doing programmable simulations. And so this is showing bang bang control. Here is my lunar lander that is going to land on the surface here. And in decades gone by before computers, you might use a proportional control system where you measured how much too fast you're going and you applied a certain amount of thrust to slow you down. You kind of control the amount of thrust you're doing. Computing, things that can measure and switch things very quickly, meant that you could come up with another strategy where you just go, I am just going to have a look and say, am I going too fast? Because if I'm going too fast, I want to turn the thruster on. And if I'm not going too fast, I want to turn the thruster off. And so this is called bang, bang control because you turn the thruster fully on or fully off. Bang, on, bang, off. And so we drop it down. And so there you can hopefully see the uh, thruster flickering on and off as it controls its descent. And so here we have the code that's running it. 
Okay, this is one that I wrote to uh, as a little bit of a demonstration. Uh, there's programmable ones uh, later on in the particular deck that one comes from where your Lunar Lander starts off upside down. It's rocky terrain and you have to land it uh, gently on the pad 300 pixels to the right. Uh, so things can get, you know, from simple to more complicated. Uh, well, that's where I'm heading kind of next. So I've been showing you these things in this deck. Let me now instead open this in a new tab and let me start showing you these things in context. So here we have a slide from one of the actual decks inside thinking about programming and this is about uh, loops. And so this is early when we're talking about syntax of programming and we just got to get Snowbot through the dreaded lava maze to the, the teleport. And in this one I can do it if I want using a drag and drop thing that looks like JavaScript. So the fact it's drag and drop means I cannot do something like miss these parentheses off can go right. So it avoids me making little irritating typos that would throw the compiler off. Uh, and I can drag this together. But as I put it together, it looks like some JavaScript code. And uh, so then once we've gone right as far as we can, I would like it to go down as far as as far as we can. And so let's make this go uh, down. And then that should get Snowbot uh, and OK, the frame rate's a bit low because I'm recording at the same time, but that should get Snowbot uh, neatly along to start heading towards the exit. And there we go, he's about to reach the end, he's going to teleport away. All right, that is using this tile-based stuff, but we don't really like to write big programs using tiles. It's a pain having to drag things, these things around. We want to be able to type. So all right, let's do it by typing. Let's flick this thing over into text mode. And let's write, instead of tiles, let us write stuff that is just JavaScript. And all right, I can I can go and, you know, click the buttons uh, to put this stuff in like that. But I can also just go, you know, while you can go right, go right. While can go down. Then I would like you to, whoops, go down. And so now that's going to do the same thing it is going to get to the exit but it's you know it's a bit more like actual programming let's zoom out and show this in context so this is the deck this is from and so as we scroll down through the slides we can see we've got you know bits of exploration uh, explanation bits of text and then we've got lots of these um, programming environments and you can run them from the from the notes format too so in this one let's just tell snowbot go right and then go right again. Whoops, I need to put an enter between those or a semicolon. And so off he goes. And so these simulations, they run even in, in the even in the notes version of it. Uh, and so we can do things that are kind of a bit like code along, because if I go up the top, you can also jump to the video. And so here is the video of the talk I was going through it. And I'm talking about things and I show things in those programming environments. Um, but because you've got the deck and those playful programming environments are live, you can grab the code that I was doing in the video and you can type it in. And you can try it out and you can change it a little bit and see what goes wrong and see how things behave. And where I make a mistake uh, online and something's gone, you can go, oh, yes, I, I, I see that. And you can kind of be a little bit more connected to what you're doing. All right. That's that particular one. Uh, we can also do a lot of scaffolding just by morphing the environment. Let me show you a thing that is, this is a graphics turtle. Now, there's a long heritage to graphics turtles since Seymour Papert in the 1970s uh, with Logo. Uh, people have been teaching people how to program by getting them to control things that are called turtles and getting them to draw shapes on the screen that range from, you know, OK, here we're just drawing high through left, forward, right, etc. to uh, at the end, uh, here is one doing Hilbert's curve. And so this is a uses two functions that call each other to do a funny kind of curve that will fill any arbitrary space. And okay, some of the one are ones that uh, I show and the code's already in there, uh, but uh, other ones uh, instead, let's go to say that one there, give you the programming environment so that you can say, well, I would like you to go uh, forward 100. I would like you to turn left 120. I would like you to go forward 100. And we can start uh, programming to do things that are quite visible on the screen. All right, but that's just, you know, painting on a canvas. That's doing stuff about shapes. Let's start changing things a bit. Let us, first of all, give the canvas a background. And so let us now say, well, actually, we're not just drawing shapes on the screen. This is the HMS Turtle, and we want to sail it into the English Channel. So let's grab that bit of code that should work. 
and let's just paste it in. And so here is the HMS Turtle happily sailing up to the safe latitude to enter the channel and hitting up the English Channel. Uh, but it's doing what's called dead reckoning. It's just, you know, saying go forward 600. But, you know, the current might be wrong or it might be not facing in the direction that it thought it was to begin with. And well, what happens if we were five degrees out when we started? Well, then instead of sailing nice and safely into into the English Channel, we go and crash into the Scilly Isles or we crash into the lizard at the, the point at the bottom of Cornwall. And we get something that looks very much like the silly, the silly naval disaster of 1707, where this sort of thing happened. Um, and so there in this deck, we're now talking about things that are about control uh, instead of just about programming. All right, let's close that one and let's do something else to this environment. Let us make the robot able to sense its environment. And so this is, uh, if when I press play on this, this turtle is going to be reading off the canvas and it's going to try and follow these black lines. And at the moment, it's following them really well, so it, you, know, you can't see it moving much. But when it gets to these green squares, it's going to know it should turn right 90 degrees. And so it's going to try and follow the line around. And so here it is trying to follow the line around. And then it's going to try and follow the line back again until it reaches the red finishing pad. So this is a maze solving exercise, a bit like those ones that we would do physically in the room, only this time you can do it from the comfort of your browser, uh, talking over email and Slack and chat and things like that with your, uh, with, your, with your friends about how to solve the problem. And so you can have that virtual uh, collaborative experience. Uh, there's another stage to it. So let me go to the next one. And here we need to uh, search the dreaded orange chemical spill to find the green survivor. And we need to rescue them by painting a blue dot on the survivor. And so there it is, searching the orange area to try and find the survivor. And when it finds it, boom, it rescues it by painting a dot on it. And so, uh, well, some of the maps that the students have to do start out relatively simple, but they soon get pretty hard to get them talking so that they're doing having those problem solving conversations uh, in their groups. All right, that's that one. Let's let's do something else to the environment. Let us make a robot that can bump into walls. So this should look a little bit like Sphero. And in this case, the sensor that I've given it is a collision sensor. And I've let you control the power to each of the motors. So let's go set uh, left power to 0 0.8 and set right power to 0 0.7. And so because the left motor is going a bit faster than the right one, we should kind of go ahead, but veer to the right. We should hit this wall. And so there it goes and it hits this wall and you can see it physically bumped into the wall and it's sticking against that wall because it's still trying to drive itself forward. So there is an actual physics simulation and these aren't just a picture. They are physical. Well, they're virtually physical, physics simulation behind the scenes. And so then in this one, the uh, this is based off a programming competition, a robotics competition, sorry, called Micromouse, uh, where you your robot has to explore the maze, find the middle, find the shortest path to the middle, and then has to race back and forth to do the fastest time it can uh, through the maze to the middle. And um, if I go to, sorry, to this one here, we can, you know, we can start teaching them the flood fill uh, maze solving algorithm. And that's just a little in, uh, animation of it. Uh, but in their groups, they then have to solve some of these mazes using their robot. All right, let's close that one. So the structure of the course has these four different challenges. And, you know, the, the first one was that... Um, Welcome to the Lava Maze. Uh, but it has a few extra characters like these blob cards that will chase you. Uh, and so there, that's just the demo to, to show him getting out. But uh, but you have kind of interesting ones where in this one, for instance, Snowbot has to go and collect that diamond, luring the blob guard up that way and then quickly run the other way around to get through the gate to the finish. And so that you can't just say right, right, up, up, right, left, down, 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 etc. The map changes a little bit. Uh, each time. So instead you have to work out, well, go right as far as you can go and then go up as far as you can go. And, and in one case, you actually have to wait a little bit to get the, the blob card uh, to chase after you. Uh, and various different, you know, fun fun little things in there. So this one, you've got to get the diamonds to get through the gate without trapping yourself under the falling boulders. Uh, then there's the rescue line, there's the micro rat one, and there is a waiter game uh, that John Vitali wrote, which is uh, done in codesandbox.io. So it is a, uh, happens outside this environment in an environment that's a bit more like professional programming. Um, 
I, I won't show you that one now for the sake of time because this video is already going to be getting a little bit long. All right. What about the self-publishing bit? We've got all these games and we've got these exercises that are getting students to try things out and chat and talk about things and program in their browsers. Toto, I've got a feeling we're not in Moodle anymore. And sure enough, we're not. We're showing stuff up onto GitHub pages and all sorts of other places um, that I showed you at the, <coughs> at the start. Well, let me talk a little bit more about this. So this here is a slide where I am actually showing students something that's going on inside the game. And so there is Snowbot, and I tell him to go right, and we're exposing some of the bits of Snowbot's internal state to teach students things about storing state of elements in programs. This site that I'm on is wbillingsley.com. Thinking about programming isn't on wbillingsley.com, and it's in a couple of other places. So something interesting has happened here because even though this talk is on a completely different site, I was able to bring in a slide from one of my thinking of programming decks, not just a picture of it, I was able to bring it in and it runs. This talk's on wbillingsley.com. In the talk, I've been showing you a lot of links to the intelligentbook.com, this personal site from my PhD uh, uh, that I've used since Cambridge days. But within UNE, the links to UNE's materials are on turing.ene une.edu.au. So somehow things are being published to multiple destinations in ways that you can do very fine-grained sharing between them. Now, let's take a step back in time. I said earlier on that some of this takes um, thematically after the theme of LaTeX publishing. So for 37 years, academics have been writing papers like their code. This isn't this site. This is when I was writing the paper that I submitted to a TICSI conference and accelerated CS0 for online mature age part-time students. And on the left, this is the LaTeX source code of that paper. So you can see lots of stuff that's in that's text in there, but you can also see code like commands like slash site or slash section introduction, say this is a section, or slash make title, or lots of other bits of code that comes up in LaTeX. So the idea of writing something that's a little bit code-like, that goes through a publication process, a compilation process to produce the rendered output, it's actually been around quite a long time in academic circles. In the early 2000s, it got really popular in industry as well uh, through something called Markdown. Uh, now, the one I'm going to show you here, this is a slide deck from another subject I teach, Software Development Studio 2. It's an older slide deck, and it looks a lot like PowerPoint. But if I was to show you under the hood, that is not really PowerPoint. That is Markdown. That is just a text file that says things like, well, here I want a new slide. This one I would like hashes to say I would like a heading that says talking about programs. Asterisks to say these should be bullet points. Um, this funny thing here to say, and I'd like you to include this image on this slide. Uh, and so it's just a bunch of text, a markup uh, that gets rendered into a slide deck for me. And this is really, really popular in the um, markdown as format is really popular in the software community. So one of the reasons programmers like text formats is we can put it under version control. So if I click that link there, here is the 2015 era, though I've updated it since, um, slide decks that I was showing you before. So if I click on classmodeling.md, it's a markdown file. Markdown is a popular enough format that GitLab knows how to render uh, markdown in a way that, you know, publishable and including uh, all those links to, uh, to, the, uh, to the images, etc. But if I click edit on it, you will see, no, that is just that markdown text. Now that has been put under version control and I could look at the history of things that I've done to it. I can edit things in here uh, and, and publish them. I'm not going to uh, worry about editing that one though. I'm just going to close that particular tab. Once it's in version control, I can also push it to more than one place. If you click that link, you'd get a login box. You wouldn't be able to see that. So for this talk, I made it so that this one, well, it's also published up to GitHub. And so there is those cost 220 uh, software development student two materials up on GitHub. And sure enough, if you click on classmodeling.md, uh, GitHub knows how to render Markdown as well. Although you notice it's not really rendering it as a slide deck. So there's something funny going on behind the scenes. I was using another script as well as just Markdown to render it as a slide deck. Uh, but if I hit edit on it, we can see, no, that is still just text in Markdown format. 
So we can put these things un under version control because uh, they are just text. Um, now, because it actually also gets loaded by an HTML file and some JavaScript into the browser, it means I can also publish it in different places and open it in the browser. So if I click this one here, that is going to show you that there is the slide deck. And in the URL bar up here, we're on Turing, we're on our student development server. And so there it is published as a slide deck running in my browser. Uh, but I could also publish it to GitHub pages. So this here uh, is now GitHub. So you see github.io at the end of the URL hosting stuff for me out in public and it runs. And the way that uh, GitHub does that is that there is a branch in the repository that it knows that it should publish as a website. Now, Markdown is very popular and it's very good for these things, but you know, none of this stuff in here behaves. These are just pictures and this is just text. Whereas I wanted this thing that could uh, let me do some more complicated stuff. It could let me include all those wonderful interactive examples. It could let me know that, um, well, this slide deck has a video associated with it. It could have the table of contents so that I can navigate between different classes, different weeks, etc. So that's a little bit more complicated than just one markdown file for a slide deck. And so this is where we get a system that I've been creating called Doctacular and GitHub Actions. And it's like the LaTeX of course publishing that I'm doing. And so this here is where I have pushed the source code of thinking about programming to uh, GitHub. And GitHub, GitHub Actions will take all this source code, um, the slide decks that I've got. And so if I jump into some of these, and so each of these are different chapters. And so let me jump into this one. And here is a script that is a particular slide deck. And so these are, you know, things that I want to show on the screen. And incidentally, you'll notice that many of the slides are Markdown slides. So I just want some stuff written in Markdown there. But then there's other ones that have some more complicated stuff going on, or there's a section title or something a little bit higher level than writing everything as raw Markdown. Well, it takes all of that stuff and it compiles it and it publishes it to another branch called the GH Pages branch. And that then, uh, let's just jump to it from here, gets published as, you know, the intelligent book.github.io slash thinking about programming. And so here is GitHub automatically publishing my materials for me as a website, including table of contents, including tutorials that behave and I can run the stuff and it's all loaded in my browser quite nicely for me. And it is all being continuously compiled. And there is that workflow that as soon as I make a change, GitHub will recompile the book for me and republish it for me. And so this one here, this is the source code, uh, sorry, this is this particular talk built, published up on GitHub pages. Uh, although there's a little trick that I've got to make it appear on the wbillingsley.com uh, uh, as well. Uh, but here is the source code for this talk, the script that is writing that deck um, that uh, GitHub is publishing for me. Uh, or here is uh, another class that I've got, which is a Scala course, a more traditional course. And most of the most of the things that are in this are actually just going to be end, end up being, um, you know, decks with PowerPoint and text in it, because the code you'd run for this one, you wouldn't run inside the browser, you'd run outside the browser. Uh, but so I can click through and, you know, here is the slide deck. Here's the video that's associated with it. And it tries to make all of that stuff kind of easy. Now, to finish up, Earlier on, I edited this text that said, Mamma Mia, here we go again. And so by now, GitHub should have finished its action of recompiling and republishing my site. So let me discover if I hit reload in the browser, whether it has published the new version. And that is now, thank you for the music. And so while we've been talking, GitHub has done a publication workflow for me. All right, I should probably leave it there. Um, lots of pro uh, stuff that I'm doing at the moment is about trying to make this stuff a lot more accessible, making it a lot easier uh, to, uh, to write uh, simple course sites as well. Although it's already, I think, uh, at the level where it is no more complicated than writing a LaTeX paper anyway. Thank you very much for watching and I will uh, see you again soon.